everyone. We're going to continue with lecture 16, moving on to part two. We will cover the last two objectives, the prevention strategies for overweight and obesity in school-aged children, which is meant to be an overview. Of course, there are numerous types of prevention strategies. We'll talk about some of them. And then <laughs> we'll talk um, from chapter 11 about a couple of conditions in young children um, to pay special attention to that have some unique circumstances. So let me just go into full slide mode. Okay. So um, childhood obesity, you know that this is um, a pu major public health issue in the United States. The prevalence of overweight and obesity has dramatically increased over the past three decades. Approximately 17.7% .7 of children ages 6 through 11 years old are obese. So if you round that up, nearly one in five children are obese, um, not overweight, obese. And Haynes indicated that childhood obesity has reached a plateau. However, a plateau means that it's still at an all-time high. We still need to see meaningful and significant, statistically significant reductions in obesity. We need to break out of our plateau. What are contributing factors? We've talked about the social ecological model and determinants of health and how it is, it is needed, it's necessary to consider factors at, at different levels across the social ecological model. So we have the individual factors. Outside of the individual, you have their more immediate surroundings, such as their homes and their schools, essentially their community. Outside of communities, you have local communities, you have larger communities, such as states and countries. And then within those states and countries, you have a higher level of policies, socio-cultural norms and values, and um, other factors that aren't always tangible. Um, contributing, all contributing to obesity. But obesity, um, in simple terms, is an imbalance between calories consumed and calories used to support growth and development. Genetics, we do know, play some role, making um, some people more prone to obese for a variety of reasons, uh, whether it's because genetics affect behavior, perhaps there are genes that make appetite, that lessen appetite regulation. So those people don't get signal. So some people may not receive as much signal when they're, um, when they're full because of, of a genetic aberration. Um, however, most of, most Contributing factors are related to behavior and lifestyle. Even when genetics are present, we know oh, sorry for yawning. We know that behavior and lifestyle, including diet and physical activity, can still influence our weight and health outcomes. So environment is really key um, for making individual behavior changes. These include environments such as the family and home, the school community. Um, and to an extent, society. So we want to be an environment that helps us succeed at achieving health. And in the United States, you could safely assume that because we have an obesity problem, we don't have these environmentally safe environments that are helping us lead healthy lifestyles, including components of diet and physical activity. In fact, we live in what are called obesogenic environments. And our environments tend to do the opposite. They tend to promote sedentary behavior. We are constantly surrounded and bombarded by food, often food that is commercially processed and higher in sugar and artificial fats and artificial flavorings and chemicals that we know do affect us and um, that we know do affect us and, um, and our health as well. So consequences of this, um, there are numerous, including increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, uh, depression and anxiety. There are social implications, including bullying, 
earlier onset of puberty due to endocrine disruptions, bone and joint issues, asthma, and sleep disorders. So can we predict childhood obesity? Um, sure, there's definitely risk factors. Maternal obesity is actually a major risk factor for a chi child becoming obese. We do know that. And it's not necessarily genetics. A lot of that has to do with the home environment. Uh, we talked about in part one of this lecture, BMI rebound. So it's normal to increase in BMI um, a little bit earlier in childhood, um, around six or seven. However, in even earlier, BMI rebound results in higher BMIs in children, we know. So something likely endocrine related might occur that, that makes that BMI rebound occur even earlier. Um, we know that that seen earlier be my rebounds, which you could see if you are monitoring a person's growth chart, um, is a risk factor. Also, excess screen time. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends children watch no more than two hours per day of screens, and that includes television time, laptop time, iPad time, cell phone time, all combined. Um, why? Because it displaces physical activity. <laughs> there are some, there are cognitive concerns as well. There are behavioral concerns that screen time causes that are beyond the scope of this discussion at the moment, but just so you're aware of. But in terms of obesity, our, one of the, large, the main concern <coughs> is it's displacing time that could be used for physical activity. So addressing the problem of pediatric overweight and obesity is important. There are expert committee evidence-based recommendations, and those include whew, those include to assess overweight and obesity using BMI for each percentile, and to encourage and promote healthy eating and increase physical activity. This is from the Academy of Pediatri American Academy of Pediatrics. The primary goal of obesity treatment is to improve long-term physical and psychosocial health through establishing permanent healthy lifestyle behaviors and changes to the environment where the child or adolescent lives. I like this advice or recommendation because it talks about improving so many different dimensions. So we have not only physical, but we have psychosocial health. We have healthy lifestyle. We have, whoops, behaviors. Um, we're on there. And we have environmental changes. <clears throat> so really all-encompassing, targeting multiple things. Um, an important thing to note that in childhood, our goal is to aim for weight maintenance. Why is this? Um, well, there's several reasons. One of them is health reasons because you don't know what's going to happen during the next growth spurt. Um, some of the weight gain might be the body's natural body fat stores that it needs for its next growth spurt. So losing too much weight could potentially interfere with that and put them at nutritional risk when they go through their next growth spurt. Um, there's also a lot of psychological issues you want to consider. We don't want to promote eating disorders, right? Um, we know that adolescence is prime time for eating disorder risk and when a lot of them manifest, although eating disorders certainly do occur earlier. Um, but we want to be mindful. We wanted to we want to promote positive relationships with food. We want to promote positive lifelong relationships with food. Telling a child to lose weight is labeling, right? You need to lose weight because you're overweight or because you're obese or because I don't want you to be fat, right? Now we're fat shaming a child. What is that going to do? That's going to sit in their head. That's They're going to going to be their health association and that could lead to disordered eating for them later in life. It's also going to interfere with their relationship with food, promote negativity, right? And we want to promote positivity. We want to promote positivity 
We want to promote happy experiences with food. We want food to be a good thing, a fun thing, a thing we like, a thing we enjoy, a thing that brings us together in family and friends and culture. Um, We don't want food to be scary, right? But as soon as you tell a child that food is what is making them quote unquote fat, that's just going right into shaming, into labeling, and we know that promotes disordered eating. So we don't like to emphasize a weight loss in children for both nutritional reasons and for psychological reasons related to eating disordered eating. Um, so it, for evidence-based approaches, the AAP is always a great, great resource to check. They frequently publish updated recommendations and position statements. And they have a, a structured weight management plan. It's in four stages. It's They are prevention plus structured weight management, comprehensive multidisciplinary intervention, and tertiary care. So here's a really nice chart. Um, I included a hyperlink in the slides to it too. Um, so for prevention plus uh, is stage one. It, and then it shows behaviors and how is it delivered. So what behaviors are encouraged during this stage and where can it be delivered? And if you go through a delivery, you'll see that stage one can be delivered pretty basic with an office visit um, through trained office support and follow-up visits. Stage two, structured weight management. Now you see an RD has been added to this list because now we're bringing in more specialized um, staff. Uh, Structured weight management may come from referrals and it's suggested at this point to have monthly visits. Behaviors uh, are also more structured. So instead of encouraging five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, it would be to do a reduced calorie eating plan. Um, Keep in mind a reduced calorie eating plan does not mean it's a weight loss plan. It means it's a reduced calorie eating plan, which is probably less calories than an overweight or obese child is currently eating. Also has focus on screen time. Stage three, is a comprehensive multidisciplinary intervention. What does that mean? Now, instead of just seeing, you know, maybe the the MD and then meeting with the dietitian, now we have a a weight management program or a team. Um, So there's more frequent contact. There's more frequent structured monitoring, goal setting, and feedback. And it's more intense to generally recommended weekly for eight to 12 weeks. And then in tertiary care, uh, this would be when all of if these stages still have have not been success, met with success then you can move into tertiary care and that includes medication surgery meal replacement and ongoing behavior change <clears throat> places of delivery include specialized pediatric weight management centers again multidisciplinary team approaches that can be found in outpatient centers or even at this point clinical or, or research protocols <clears throat> In addition to nutrition changes, physical activity is important. Children should engage in at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day. Parents are encouraged to set an example. They should limit media and computer use, and they should work out or exercise or engage in physical activities themselves. Um, An an interesting statistic is actually less than 10% of middle school and junior high schools in the United States require daily physical activity. So most of our public schools in the United States are not meeting every single day for physical activity. So not a lot of children aren't meeting these recommendations. There are determinants of physical activity that we know from research. These include girls tend to be less physically active than boys. We know that physical activity decreases with age. The season and climate impact level of physical activity. I once was involved in an ancillary study and that showed up in our data from, and it was in the Bronx, which is an urban community, that during the winter, physical activities were lower. Not surprising, right? It's obvious, but we do like to have data to confirm those things. So during the winter, it's cold, you're in the Bronx, it's hard to go outside in general, 
And of course, it's even harder in the winter. So physical activity is a really big problem in the Bronx during the winter, especially when we have coupled that with physical education in school decreasing. Where are children playing? Where are they going outside to play and to run um, and to engage in physical activity? These are all questions that we still we need to absolutely address. Um, there are, of course, organized sports. And when participation participation as possible, it's linked to lower incidence of overweight. Now think of our urban communities, our low income urban communities again. Um, organized sports still aren't always an option. So limited gym, limited organized sports, limited safe places to play outside. Now you're looking at really inactive areas and not surprising, we do see increased obesity in these in these areas. So the AAP recommends participating in a variety of activities, organizing sports, um, although that shouldn't take the place of regular physical activity. You still want to encourage physical activity, walking, um, just doing any, any day movement um, for, older, for adults, cleaning, um, or children that like to clean, they can clean too, cleaning their room, um, playing with friends. Those are all physical activities you can do throughout the day that we know contributes to weight management in addition to organized sports, which tends to be more of a form of exercise, um, which is physical activity that's structured and tends to be at a, a more intense level. Um, and always, of course, remember proper use of safety equipment because we don't want to have injuries. So... <laughs> School for, for school age children, nutrition education is really prime time for learning. Um, yes, if we can intervene with parents preconceptually, that's great. Um, if we intervene in infancy and and toddlers and preschoolers, yes, we do. We want to intervene at those stages too. But this stage is unique. Why? Because children are now more autonomous, right? A five, a six, an eight, a 10, a 12-year-old, they can really understand the messaging and they can take it, they can internalize it, and now they have some control over themselves. So they are a little more independent from their parents at this point where perhaps the parent doesn't engage in physical activity, but a child does get messaging all day long that they need to have a healthy lifestyle, that it's good for them, that they need to do physical activity. You know, eventually that could be something that could overcome the parent's um, lack of interest in physical activity, right? So because of that autonomy, nutrition education in school age children is really important. We do know that interventions that target both children in schools and families are more successful. They're called multi-level interventions because they target multiple levels of the social ecological model. And changing the school environment, changing home environment, changing, increasing nutrition education levels of children and of families are all really successful. So champion and advocate for those in your future work. <clears throat> okay, so be familiar with prevention strategies for overweight and obesity, including the AAP um, recommended stages. Now we're going to go um, just a little bit into some common pediatric conditions um, and terms just, just to be aware of. So one of them is failure failure to thrive. It's, it's a term that you will definitely hear in your futures. Um, there's AAP diagnosis criteria of weight, or weight for height falls less than two standard deviations below the Z-score for sex and matched peers, so age and sex. Um, and then weight for age having declined across two major percentile lines after a relatively stable growth period. So remember, we talk about charting those growth curves and looking for any abnormalities. So if you see kind of this stable growth period and then all of a sudden this drop uh, across two lines, that could that's a red flag. You should look into failure to thrive more. According to Johns Hopkins Children's Center, children are diagnosed with failure to thrive when their weight or rate of weight gain is significantly below that of other children of similar age and gender. <clears throat> um, I mentioned Z-score. You don't need to know this for the test, but I did just want to briefly introduce you to it because you might come across it. It's a new 
numerical value assigned to the standard deviation from the mean of a data set. A z-score of 1 equates to 1 standard deviation, so if you've taken statistics, you can imagine your bell curve above the mean or the 50th percentile. Um, a child at a 5th percentile would have a z-score of 1.75, so you essentially use, use statistical software or statistics calculations to convert the percentile into a z-score, and here's how they can translate. So a zero would be 50th percentile. If you go above zero, then you increase in percentile to the a greater than the third would be greater than the 99th. Um, and then conversely, if you go into the negatives, you um, go lower on the percentile. <clears throat> so failure to thrive, there are two forms to be aware of. There is organic and non-organic. Organic failure Failure to thrive is a lack of growth associated with an identifiable disease. So we can identify a disease that's contributing to failure to thrive. That's not the case with non-organic failure to thrive. And non-organic failure to thrive, it's not necessarily identifiable. Um, you don't need to know all of these for the exam, but just be, be familiar, though, with organic failure to thrive versus non-organic failure to thrive regarding ter the terminology and definitions of those terms. So for non-organic um, failure to thrive, these are causes such as poverty, abuse, feeding difficulties, poor bonding. So that would be poor, poor mother bonding with her infants and, and children can lead to failure to thrive. It can cause some psychopathology in children and also there's other psychopath pathologies in children that can cause or non-organic failure to thrive. So these are things that are less tangible um, to us. They're harder to pick up on, harder to diagnose. Of course, feeding difficulties can be diagnosed and, and can be an organic reason for failure to thrive. Um, oops. And then some of the identifiable causes include um, asthma or lung difficulties, having a cleft plate, which would lead to feeding difficulties. It's an oral uh, dysfunction at, at birth, having cystic fibrosis, which is another type of, of pulmonary disease, having digestive diseases like celiac or IBS or irritable bowel, short gut syndrome is on here. Um, Fatty acid synthesis disease is, is metabol some metabolic disorders are associated with failure failure to thrive. Food allergies or gen genetic disorders. We talked about intrauterine growth restriction um, during pregnancy can be a cause of failure to thrive. Remember, though, we learned that intrauterine growth restrict restriction does not necessarily mean that growth is restricted outside of the room, but in some cases, we can see it. So nutrition management, if the child is still breastfeeding, uh, a woman can pump. They have uh, modulars that you can add to form to express milk to increase the calorie content. If children are on solid foods, it's you can manipulate the diet to maximize the caloric density of foods, including adding sources of fat such as corn oil um, or butter or other types of oil. Um, including you want to make sure they're getting polyunsaturated fatty acids. You can use infant cereal, and they also have modulars to add to um, regular foods to boost calories. Um, for children, it's especially important to have a routine. We've talked about how children thrive on routine. Um, do not allow eating between scheduled meals and snacks, such as like grazing all day, because that can reduce the amount of of meal that a child eats or amount of scheduled snack that they eat and you want to make sure that they're eating nutritious and calorically dense foods. Feed children at a table or in booster. This goes along with making sure they're in a routine, they're not distracted, and hopefully they'll, they'll um, get enough calories at their meal time. Praise positive behavior. So if a child is eating the food that they're served, taking bites of it, trying it, or trying new foods, give them praise for doing that. That's that's wonderful. Um, you do want to be careful punishing around foods, such as taking taking things away, putting them in timeout, because again, you want to balance that 
negative association with foods and mealtime for children because we don't want to give them disordered eating when they're older. Um, you can allow children to get messy. That's fine. It can be fun. You know, they're learning how to eat. Mess is okay at this age. Um, and of course, caregivers should model the behavior themselves. Um, and I would say more sort extreme circumstances. Um, there are medications, including appetite stimulants that can be used, um, and sometimes tube feedings are needed. Um, there's also inborn errors of metabolism. So <clears throat> these are genetic mutations that cause, that are often at birth, um, and they are, sorry, <clears throat> that develop during um, during gestation and children are born with them. And sometimes they are diagnosed at birth, sometimes they're diagnosed later in life. <clears throat> and there's autosomal um, and then there's recessive genes, just a refresher. Um, <clears throat> and Let's see. Your autosomal are your non-sex chromosomes, 1 to 22, and a recessive gene is an allele that causes a phenotype. It's a detectable or visible characteristic or a trait. Um, so you need to have an allele to have a specific phenotype. They can be dominant. They can be recessive. Um, <clears throat> and you can go back into biology and read re those terminologies. It's not important for, the for our test. Um, but just a brief refresher that that um, is how genes are passed along. So there's over 300 genetic disorders related to either deficiency, excess, or altered metabolism or normally occurring compounds. Um, in inborn era metabolism, most involve enzyme defect or proteins leading up to the build of substrate, and it's that substrate that causes toxicities and harm in the body. You need to consider if a non-essential amino acid becomes essential, such as it does in phenylketonuria. In 2008, there were laws for screening conditions, um, including 28 of the more common inborn errors of metabolism, such as phenylketonuria, maple syrup, urine disease, organic acidemia, galactosemia, biotinidase deficiency, urea cycle disorders, and fatty acid oxidation disorders. I'm just going to cover a couple of them. Um, and just to note, too, that in New Jersey, uh, we screen for a total of 55 disorders um, at birth, which is really great. Um, we're more advanced than other states. And if these disorders are not detected early, can cause severe health problems, um, which can even lead to mental retardation or even death. So definitely be familiar with PKU, which I know that we did have covered before. It's the body lacks the enzyme needed to metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine to tyrosine, making phenylalanine um, essentially toxic to the body because it can't break it down. So we remove phenylalanine from the diet. Um, and the other one, which a recent student had this on, on the RDN exam, so I wanted to make sure to include it here, it's maple syrup urine disease. This is where our body lacks enzymes to metabolize branched chain amino acids. Those include leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, byproducts can cause a distinct sweet odor in the uterine. That's why it's called maple syrup urine disease. The, the urine becomes like maple syrup um, in smell. I don't think the thickness is, I think it, it has more to do with the odor than like the actual thickness of the urine. Um, and then, so byproducts accumulate um, and causes issues, including poor feeding, vomiting, low energy or lethargy, delayed development and poor movement. And if, treat, if untreated, can lead to seizures and death and classically and most frequently seen soon after birth um, and less frequently later in infancy or childhood. Um, the more delayed the diagnosis, the more harm that it can cause to the body. So um, that ends today's lecture on special topics in child nutrition. 
Our next lecture will be on adolescent nutrition, and I'll post it to Moodle, and we'll try to all meet for Zoom on Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then looking ahead, we have Module 3 is due on the 22nd. Your final short review paper is due to 429, is due on 429 to the Dropbox and Moodle. You'll have a Module 4, which will be due the day of the final exam, and then um, I still don't know the final exam schedule. I'll figure, hopefully figure that out this week for you. Um, will be a Moodle and it will be similar to test two. So if you have any questions, please send me an email. I hope, hope, hope you guys are all doing well, staying healthy, staying sane, as sane as possible. I know it's tough. You guys are doing a really great job. Keep focused on your schoolwork. Get through the semester. Just get it behind you. Get your classes done. Get your grades in um, and move on. And this, this too shall pass. So remember that. Stay strong. And I look forward to talking with you again. Bye-bye.